Let's do let's do that one. All right, I won't be able to see questions while I'm presenting, um, but I'll get to them after after the talk. Great. Uh, all right, my name's Rob Emanuel. I'm a geospatial architect for uh, Microsoft on the environmental sustainability team and AI for Earth. And I want to talk to you today about uh, phosphor G and the climate crisis. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about Microsoft AI for Earth and you know why we're the diamond sponsor uh, of, of phosphor G this year. Um, you know, I don't know. I know if I was an attendee a couple of years back, I might be like, oh, Microsoft, that's an interesting, interesting choice. Uh, maybe have a little bit of uh, some thoughts about how Microsoft, you know, interacted with open source back in the, the first decade um, in the 21st century. Um, but under the leadership of Satya Nadala, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft owns GitHub and is, is a big prominent of an open source software. Uh, but specifically around Phosphor G, I'll answer that question by going into our uh, sustainability work. So Microsoft is committed uh, to using its technology, its cloud, uh, to build a more sustainable future. And those commitments um, are specific and there are four specific areas, right? So um, in 2020, uh, we announced uh, that we were committed to being carbon negative by 2030 and not just that, uh, by 2050 to have removed all the carbon it's ever emitted since its founding in 1975. Uh, committed to being water positive by 2030. And that means that um, Microsoft will replenish more water than it consumes on a global basis. Committing to zero waste. Um, so our goal is to achieve uh, zero waste for Microsoft's direct operations, products, and packaging uh, by 2030. And also uh, to protect our ecosystems, right? So committing to protecting more land than we use by 2025. Um, and also as part of this, uh, building and deploying what we're calling a planetary computer. And that's what I work on. Uh, I'm an engineer on the team building out um, the services around our open data and um, uh, analytics. Uh, and all of that is built on Phosphor G. It's very specifically built on uh, an open source and you know, really stands on the shoulders of the giants of this community. Um, so really excited to, you know, be able to sponsor this conference um, and to, you know, give our support and really happy that I can be uh, speaking with you today. But I'm not going to be uh, talking about the planetary computer today. If you're interested, uh, go ahead and see my talk tomorrow uh, where I'll be going over some of the technical details um, of how we're utilizing open source software and um, you know the architecture of my entire computer. What I want to talk to you, you today about is the climate crisis. Um, so I uh, am very privileged to be working with a number of you know, very smart um, scientists uh, that are you know really close to. Um, the science of, of what's going on with the warming climate. And so I wanted to just bring some of the lessons that I have learned, um, you know, le learning from them uh, to this conference um, and specifically around some of the results that uh, you can uh, take away from the IPCC report recently in August. Um, the first section of AR6 was released. Uh, subsequent sections will be released over the coming year, uh, but this one focused specifically on the physical science basis. And um, I'll just, you know, asterisks like I'm not an environmental scientist. Um, so this is some of my interpretations of what um, very smart people uh, have have told me. So um, if I'm incorrect, please correct me in the comments. Um, go ahead and yell at me. Uh, so one of the things, uh, the sort of like key takeaways is that um, you know 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial average uh, could be reached within a decade, and it's more likely than not uh, to be breached even um, 
even in the scenario where we get to uh, net zero by 2050, uh, there's an aggressive um, cutting of carbon uh, as well as uh, you know, removing uh, carbon from the air, um, we're, we're more likely than not to breach 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that number is sort of important because um, in 2015, during COP21, uh, there was the Paris Agreement that was entered into force in, in 2016. And that had a goal of um, you know, keeping uh, global warming well below two degrees Celsius, uh, but preferably below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, and it looks like we've already, you know, five years later sort of missed that mark. Um, and then, so this isn't part of the IPCC report, but other research, um, uh, you know, current policies have us missing that by a, a wide, wide margin uh, where we're on track to reach three degrees Celsius of warming um, by uh, 2100. And so it's important to, note that the the warming the number that signifies the sort of mean uh warming of the planet um does not mean that like every location will just have that that warming right um it's uh, generally larger over land than it is oceans um so based on a location um that the the warming that's experienced uh will be significantly different and you can see in the north um seems like the the warming that would be experienced is is a lot greater and so another thing that was um kind of key takeaway from the ipcc report is that uh the tipping points are presented uh with greater confidence and concern um so abrupt potentially catastrophic and irreversible changes are presented with more specificity and confidence than in previous reports uh one example of this and there's uh, um, some other research uh, talking about early warning signs around this uh, overturning circulation, and um, you know the, these things could potentially collapse, disrupting rain that farmers rely on to grow food in Africa and South America, making winters more extreme in Europe, and further destabilizing the Greenland ice sheet and the Amazon rainforest. Um, other examples of tipping points highlighted in the report include rapid melting of the Antarctic ice sheet, permafrost collapse, and permanent forest loss. And while the report considered these events with a low likelihood of happening this century, it also reports with a high confidence that they can't be ruled out. Uh, one sort of pretty stark takeaway um, that hit me was that uh, we've likely already hit 1.5 in warming, um, but we're also emitting aerosols into the air that have a cooling effect. Um, so we're only experiencing, we're only observing 1.1 degrees Celsius, that warming, because of the aerosol uh, emissions. And, uh, you know, it's important to know that uh, greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere longer than aerosols. So if we were to stop emitting both greenhouse gases and aerosols tomorrow, aeros the aerosols would disappear faster than the greenhouse gases. And so, in effect, we would experience warming due to that um, uh, remove all aerosols in the, in the air, right? But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's indication that rapid aggressive emission cuts coupled with uh, carbon di dioxide removal, um, a lot of the stuff that, you know, Microsoft is working on being a purchaser in. Um, there was just a Nature article published around our processes for trying to um, you know, really invest in the carbon removal market and do large uh, purchases of carbon renewal. Um, but that type of work could limit uh, warming well below uh, two degrees Celsius, even if we would dip um, above or uh, breach 1.5 uh, at some point and then dip down uh, to lower the um, last part of the century. But I think it's important to talk about it, not necessarily as climate change that's happening in the future, right? This is a climate crisis is happening right now. Um, one of the things that the IPCC report uh, has been able to take advantage of is the science that's gotten better at attributing uh, um, weather events, climate events to human uh, human induced climate change. Uh, and so they're able to do that um, for things happening right now. And we can see that uh, in hot uh, the 
uh, number of hot extreme events has increased already with high confidence. Um, the number of uh, observed change in heavy participation has changed. Um, and then also uh, agricultural and ecological uh, droughts. So this is something that's, that's, that's already here, right? And um, so I just wanna take a moment to say the magnitude of this problem can be uh, super overwhelming. I know that um, I feel very overwhelmed by it often. Um, and especially with, you know, everything that's going on uh, with the pandemic and just, just the world, it's, it's kind of easy to get, um, yeah, kind of discouraged about the, the outlook. But I want to say that, um, you know, we in the Foster G community uh, are positioned to make a difference. Um, I really believe that geospatial data is uh, a critical, irreplaceable asset in the work, not just uh, the work that's going on now, but in all of the future challenges presented by the climate crisis, it will be important. Uh, there's the saying that you can't manage what you can't measure, and all of the measurements at a planetary scale uh, deal with location and time, right? And um, the sensors that we have up in space looking down on our planet are collecting data that's irreplaceable. Like there's nothing else that can kind of give those measurement measurements. Um, so it's really important, important data in dealing with this crisis. And we've made leaps and strides uh, in, you know, being able to utilize that data. But I think we have a, a really long way to go. Um, you know, this isn't sort of a new idea, right? So 20, 2018 keynote, uh, Chris Holmes at Foster GNA um, had a great talk um, called uh, Towards a Queryable Earth. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend going. It's, it's still very relevant. Um, and one of the key points of this where he lays out sort of a blueprint of how we go from data to um, uh, you know, something where you can query anything on the planet um, is this last part, which is that uh, the GIS and remote sensing is abstracted away. And so I think this is a really important point that we're still very far from, right? We as uh, geospatial experts, as the people using and building uh, Phosphor G, open source geospatial software, um, are the ones responsible for, for handling that complexity, the complexity of the data and the complexity of the processes that uh, are inherently geospatial. And unless we're delivering something that abstracts away all that technical complexity, we're not quite there yet. And I really believe that the work we're, we do now um, to make this data and technology easier, faster, more efficient, uh, won't just help with the current challenges, but also set the future up for success. And I think that's like really important to keep top of, top of mind because while the climate, climate crisis is here and we're already feeling the effects, the people who will be really uh, dealing with it, uh, you know, might be, you know, several decades out. And so what can we be doing now that sets those people up for success? Um, and hopefully they're not still scratching their heads about how to find and manipulate uh, uh, geospatial data. And that'll be a solved problem. So yeah, you know, a question would be like, what do we build now that would be most useful in the future? The future is very far away and who knows what will happen? Who knows what um, the needs will be? So I think this is, you know, an open, there's not a real answer to this, uh, but what we can do is kind of look at um, sort of what are the lasting technologies uh, that have been around uh, in previous decades that are still useful today? And I'll just highlight GDAL. Uh, the initial release was in uh, June 2000. And so two decades later, um, it's used everywhere, right? It's still just so uh, widely used. It's a, it's a, it solves a problem that was, is a problem today, just like it was a problem in 2000. Right. And so I was having a conversation with uh, Frank Warmerdam, 
the founder of GDAL, uh, several years back. And I asked him, I was like, why did you, why did you start GDAL? And uh, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, he's like, well, I looked, I looked for uh, the problem that nobody wanted to work on that everybody had. And everybody was having issues with data formats and reading in data in a, in a consistent way. And it was hard work and it was boring work. It wasn't the glamorous work that was going on, but I decided to take that on and solve that problem. Um, and then the community that's built around GDAL um, continues that to this day, uh, solving those sort of low level IO problems that everybody has. Uh, if we didn't have GDAL, <laughs> it would be a lot harder, um, uh, but we can solve it sort of in a general way that, that lets people concentrate on um, the work that they're getting to, right? And then, so I think that's a that's a huge lesson that I've carried forward, uh, and I hope maybe you can take some inspiration from as well um, to build lasting solutions. You know, focusing on those hard, fundamental, and potentially boring problems that um, that are keeping everyone from doing more interesting work uh, and shouldering that. And so I think that's uh, you know that's what we need to be doing. Not necessarily that's boring work, but there's important foundational work. Uh, that we need to be doing. And I like to think about it in um, these four areas where, uh, you know, focusing on the data that's available, how do we get those data into the proper formats to be, uh, you know, cloud optimized and, and uh, ready for use. The access, uh, you know, how are, how are people accessing that data? Um, you know, how are people searching for the data that they need? Uh, analytics. There's a wide variety of uh, analytics that you'd want to apply to this data once you find the data that you're interested in, um, including combining different data sets and, and how easy is that? Uh, how easy is that to do, right? And then finally, uh, applications, because the insights derived from analytics uh, from accessing the data, right, don't mean much unless they're applied um, to impact specific uh, decisions or optimize certain processes, or man, you know, ultimately manage uh, Earth's natural natural systems. So I'm just going to talk about data and access uh, today because of time. Um, but so yeah, there's a wide range of types. There's optical imagery, which I think um, you know we got a pretty good handle on. Uh, I think Landsat um, being put up as uh, cloud optimized geotest was a huge um, sort of leg up in in that. Uh, effort to make uh, raster data, um, imagery data, uh, really accessible and easy to use. Um, but there's other types: synthetic average radar, hyperspectral imagery, point cloud, um, and all these all these types are in various states of having, you know, cloud optimized formats. Uh, and some don't even have like a really good standardized format. Like with SAR, you know, how do you? What's the file type for complex amplitude and phase? Um, I'm sure there's that exists, but like I don't think it's nearly as far as um, uh, along as some of the other data types. So we need to get everything into a format that um, is solid and cloud optimized, right? And so like re some recent work out of uh, Howard Butler's group uh, to do the cloud optimized uh, point cloud um, is really awesome and exciting, and sort of um, you know puts us along this trajectory where. Uh, the more things that we can get into a format, like it take take uh, Cog as, as sort of like a leading example, um, a format that works with existing tooling, but also uh, allows for cloud optimized reading. Um, I think it's really really important work, right? And so uh, I just want to highlight um, this paper that um, was just put out uh, very recently. Uh, uses open big earth data. An analysis of the current state, and it sort of highlights um, the point of you know why cloud optimized. Well, given the growing amount of data volumes, cloud-based services seem the only realistic way forward for data providers and users. So it's that, but there's another section that talks about the um, survey responses and who downloads data, and it's everybody. I mean, we're still we're still downloading data, which is not you know the problem of the user. It means that it's not easy enough. It's not the quickest way to access data yet. Um, you know, I download data, like everybody does it. Um, and we need to be moving to a future that 
working with the data in the cloud is just as easy. Like you would make that choice because it was the easier choice. And then so just because data is available, there's a file somewhere on the cloud, uh, doesn't mean that it's accessible, right? And so I think there's been leaps and bounds uh, towards this, but it still remains a challenge to find uh, only the data you need across all the uh, different data types, right? And so standards like the Spatio Temporal Asset Catalog and the suite of API uh, standards from OGC help uh, enable a, um, an ecosystem of tooling to be able to speak the same language and uh, you know, give greater access to these data types. And I think that there's a lot of work to do to um, not only like continue fleshing out those specs, but also building out those those tools. So it's, there's no searching uh, for what you need. It's 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 um, clear how to access uh, all these different data types. So I'm going to end with another uh, another sort of quote um, that I carry I carry with me, and it was um, January Makamba. Uh, Minister of State of Tanzania, who in the Depository 2018 Dar es Salaam keynote um, said very bluntly, if geospatial tools and data do not serve humanity, then they are simply toys. And I take that to heart because there's a lot of really cool things we're doing in the geospatial uh, community, but we need to be connecting it back to the impact that it's having. And I think, you know, finding a way uh, even if it's a small way of, of connecting your work, work back to, um, you know, setting the future up for success in dealing with the climate crisis is, is really important work that does serve humanity. And I know that we, a lot of us know that and we're trying and I just want to recognize that and, you know, thank you for your work uh, towards that and uh, encourage, encourage you to, to continue. Um, and a lot of people who are doing really awesome work towards that are speaking in our track today. Um, so I encourage you to stick around. And uh, I know I'll be learning a lot from uh, the lineup of amazing speakers. And yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your time. I'm going to switch back to checking comments now. OK. have to get the hang of this real quick. Remove that. Thanks. Yeah, as uh, Stephen mentioned in the chat, there is a uh, open call for um, for grants that uh, with with in collaboration with Geo, um, there's a new one that uh, specifically around how to utilize the NICV uh, data um, from Planet, uh, and actually Tara Shea will be speaking about that program later. So I'm really excited to um, to hear her uh, describe uh, that data set and uh, looking forward to collaborating with the um, participants of that of that program.